Right. So um, it's nice to be talking to you all, even though I can't actually see you. Um, <coughs> and it would be much nicer if we were doing this face to face, but it is what it is. So it's nice to see you, and I hope that um, you can see the video, and by now you can also see the slide which says phoneme systems and writing. So I'll try and keep an eye on the comments so that if there are any comments along the way, you can make them. So I wanted today to talk about something very particular, which I think has come up as a bit of an issue, and that is the relationship between the phonemic systems of languages and the writing systems used to write them. Because there's actually a very considerable difference between those two in some languages. Um, I could have made this a much longer study, but I think it is quite useful as it is to just talk about two languages that we know a bit about. Okay, so just some um, uh, revision, I suppose, if you like, phonemes, what are phonemic systems? So phoneme can be de defined in many ways, but a perceptually distinct unit of sound in a specified language. So the phoneme system from one language to the next will be different. And these distinguish one word from another, like p and b in English, like p and b, and also d and t. But in this case, pad and pat are distinguished from bad and bat because p as an initial phoneme is a different sound, perceptually different sound, is systematically different sound from b. But in phonemic systems, in languages that I have some knowledge about and some information about or have been researching, these p and b sounds are very different. Now, everyone can pronounce all of these sounds and might even use them from time to time, but they are not always distinct. So in Assamese, we know that ba, ba, pa, ba, and pa, and I don't pronounce the last one very well, but we know that those are four distinct sounds. They are written with four different letters. If you change one to another, you will get for distinct um, meanings. In Bangkok Thai, you just have bo, po, and mbo. You just have three of those as distinct sounds. In English, we only have two, p and b, we say them. And the p phoneme can be realized as aspirated p at the beginnings of words like pot and pink but can also be realized unaspirated, as in a word like spot or um, speed or something. And so these two in the minds of English speakers are the same sound, but of course, Assamese speakers will distinguish bo from po on every occasion. And in the Aboriginal languages of Victoria, which I also research, there's just a single bilabial stop that could be written as either P or B. So in these four different languages, all of which are equally complicated and interesting in their own way, in these four different languages, you can have a distinction of four bilabial stops as in Assamese, three as in Bangkok Thai, two as in English, and just one as in the Aboriginal languages of Victoria. So that's just a bit of, of a reminder of phonemic systems. Now, English consonants are here listed on slide three. And again, we just have the p, b distinction in the bilabials, t, d in the alveolars, k, g in the velars. We have a lot of fricatives, f, v, th, th, s, z, sh, j, and h. We have the affricates, ch and j, and we have the, na the voiced nasals, m, n, n, and n is only used at the ends of syllables. And we have the liquid voiced, 
la, ra, and the glide voice were, yeah, those last ones at the bottom can be described in many different ways, but this is the list of consonants in English. Now, the issue that I really want to talk about today is how this matches with writing. And what you'll notice already is that for a significant number of these English consonants, the IPA script has to write something different from an English letter. So, for example, th and th, the, they're, here they're there listed as dental or some would say interdental fricatives and the palatal fricatives sh and j, these can't be written with letters in the Roman alphabet. So how does this system relate to writing? Well, there are 24 consonant phonemes in English. If we go back to slide three for a moment, we can count them up and you will find that there are 24. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 24 of them. And the Latin Roman alphabet that we use in English has 26 letters, but five of these are termed as vowels. I put this in inverted commas because, I mean, they are, these symbols are generally used to indicate vowels, but there are many more vowels than just five in English. And there are 21 consonant symbols. So that leaves 21 consonant symbols. And we have 24 um, consonants. So what do we do? Well, it's, it's not just that we have to use double letters, that we have to use, um, <coughs> just checking the comments to make sure that um, there is nothing, oops, nothing extraordinary come through there. Very good. Okay, so in some cases we have to use double consonants. So we'll go back to slide, um, oh, I will go back to slide three for a moment. So for example, to indicate the dental voiceless fricative th and the dental voiced fricative the, we need to use a double consonant and they are both written with th. To use the palatal voiceless fricative sh is usually written with sh, though there are some occasions when it isn't. The voiced one zh um, this, um, like in a word like pleasure, there is no single letter that writes that. This comes from words that have been borrowed from French long ago, mostly, um, the je sound. And there is no single letter to write that. Um, ch, which is the voiceless affricate, is usually written with ch, but there are situations where it isn't, and so on. There. There are a lot of tricks with comparing the difference between English phonology and English writing. And it would, we could spend a whole lecture just talking about the consonants and I, I'm not going to do that. But so not only do you have to write some of these consonants in English with double letters, but some of the consonants are written with different symbols, even though the sound is the same. So in the, for the k sound, in a word like kick, kick, which has a k at the beginning and a k at the end, same phoneme, at the beginning of the word it's written k, at the end of the word it's written ck. If on the other hand you have a word like cat, that particular animal cat, has a C at the beginning. If, on the other hand, you are writing a word like queen, queen, then you have, this also has a K at the beginning. The Q sound or the QU symbols indicate that there's a K followed by a W. So actually K, C, CK, and even in a sense Q, all indicate a k sound, all indicate a voiceless velar stop in English. And s, sometimes written with s, often written with s, but also sometimes written with c, as in ceiling, ceiling. 
Now this is a real complication for English spelling because you have a word like seal, that the animal or the um, item that you, you know, something that you stamp, seal, that's written S-E-A-L, but sealing, which has the same initial syllable, is written C-E-I-L-I-N-G. So English is very, very inconsistent in the relationship between consonant phonemes and the way of writing them. Now, why has this come about? And this is really the main reason why I wanted to talk to you today. So it's come about because English is written in a borrowed alphabet. It's written in an alphabet that was created for a different language. And was created for a different language a long time ago. And moreover, it was created with influence from other alphabets. And it was a language that itself changed. So the current alphabet for English comes from Latin or from the Latin language. And it's usually called either the Latin or the Roman alphabet. Both of these terms can be used. And it was developed over a long time with influence from Greek. And so I've put in a table here that I got from this very interesting Wikipedia article about the Latin alphabet of two different versions of the script that was used um, <coughs> in the old Latin period or archaic Latin period. And what you can see there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 letters. Okay, so there's a few missing. So you will notice, for example, that the seventh letter is not G, as we would expect, but Z, come to that story in the moment. You'll then notice that there is no J. You'll then notice that the end part of the alphabet is very much restricted. There's no U, there's no W, there's no Y, and the Z, as I mentioned, had was shifted, occurred in an earlier part of the alphabet. That was the effect of Greek language. So I've just included um, a little note from the Wikipedia article down the bottom that the letter C was the Western or Latinate form of the Greek gamma um, symbol. I haven't time to talk to you about gamma, but that's what that symbol is still used in modern Greek today. And it says here was used for the sounds g and k alike. Um, so the suggestion here is that this was the influence of another language called Etruscan which was spoken um, in what is now Italy to the north of where Rome is a long time ago. It's a very sad story that the Etruscan language was long ago lost. And one of the first examples of language documentation, we could say, was undertaken by um, the grandson of the adopted grandson, I suppose we should call him, of the Roman emperor, um, uh, a young man called Claudius, who was s somewhat disabled. He'd, um, he worked with a limp and he was regarded by people as being rather stupid. And yet what he achieved was a kind of a dictionary and possibly some kind of grammatical documentation of the Etruscan language. Unfortunately, this has got lost. So we don't know very much about that language. Later on, uh, if you're interested in the history, it is worth reading about, um, Claudius was made emperor of Rome um, and they, the people who made him emperor thought he was a good choice because they thought he was, he was stupid and they could um, manipulate him, but it turned out to be rather different. And um, anyway, the history of ancient Rome is interesting, but the point that I'm making here is that the Etruscan language may not have had a difference of voicing between g and k might have been like the Aboriginal languages of Victoria. And therefore, when the Romans started borrowing writing under influence from the Etruscans, they didn't see the need to write this distinction either. And so this is an important point I'm trying to make, that 
Languages often use writing systems that are borrowed from somewhere else and that consequently from the start when they adopt them, those systems do not tell you, do not properly write the phoneme distinctions in language. And some of you, I, I, I'm not sure if Deep is listening, I think he is, um, will be aware of this, but also others who've um, done some work with the Tangsa languages or other languages will know that people in those communities often try and write a, if you like, simplified version of their language using the Roman script. And because there are sounds in those languages, distinct sounds in those languages that are not distinctions that are not found in English or in Assamese, they write them with the same letter. This is in effect what the Latins did. Now gradually over time, they replaced, they added a couple more letters to create the um, alphabet that we have today. Although I have to tell you that I and J were used into, were in effect alternate versions of writing the same sound in Old Latin, um, and also U and V were sort of alternated with each other. They've become different symbols in English, but they were not originally. And our Latin, it turns out, had 10 vowels. It had an A, E, I, O, U, and an A, E, I, O, U. It had long and short vowels. But there were certain rules about when you used the long one and when you used the short one that people didn't feel the need to write these distinctions down. And so what happened is that now from a phonemic perspective, we would have preferred that they did. But what happened is that they did not write these vowel distinctions. And even though the length distinction is phonemic, but it's kind of predictable in a way. So the word for girl in the nominative or subject case, puella, with a short a, and in the ablative case, meaning from the girl or by the girl, has a long final a, puella. So puella and puella. In old Latin inscriptions, these are written the same, just with the letter a, which, of course, in the original language, they only used what we now call the capital forms. They didn't use the small forms at all. And if you look at ancient Roman inscriptions, I should have put one up. Um, you see only capitals. Today, we sometimes write the ablative form puella with a, a bar or a macron over the A to indicate that it is long, but the ancient Romans didn't do that. Okay, so English then, has adopted an alphabet from a language which had itself developed the alphabet from um, partly from the Etruscans, partly from the Greeks, did not write all of the distinctions in their language and therefore when adopted into English, it was not written with all the distinctions either. I haven't time to go through the whole of the vowel situation in detail but if you look at this um, diagram of vowels in Australian English, um, what you can see, and these are simple vowels, and does, do not include things like um, the uh, O vowel in so, because the Australian English speakers will pronounce that with a diphthong, O, O, so so. So these are, um, if I was going to say, um, this little i here, this would be the i as in bit. This would be the e as in beat. This would be the e as in bet. This would be the um, er as in bert, which is someone name, someone's name. At down here as in bat. Um, r as in bart. Not quite sure what that. Um, there's an a here that should be. In actually, they're sort of suggesting that the a uh, as in but is a short version of that. You have o uh, as in bot, which is um, not, well, it's a kind of word, but bottle. This is the um, o as in bought, 
u as in but. We don't say but, but we can say put. Um, and then this is u over here, the Australian u as in boot. Um, this is not a sound that people in India make, this boot sound. And <clears throat> in fact, um, there's a, this is bet, but there's also um, bait, which is the long version of that. So there's actually 14 different vowel sounds in Australian English. And yet we only have five vowels to write them with, five vowel symbols to write them with. So English isn't the only language which has a complicated relationship between its phonology and the writing system. And I thought one language that we could briefly discuss in this connection is Assamese. And I found on the Wikipedia page this excellent chart, which indicates the relationship between, um, if you like, between the phonemes. So each one of these is a separate phoneme in Assamese and the symbols used for writing them. So the labial ones are relatively straightforward, you know, ba, pa, ba, ba, and ma. They're relatively straightforward. There's a single symbol for each one of those sounds. It's a direct matching between sound and symbol. But as you get into the middle group, the alveolars, there's a real complexity. So there's two different symbols that are both pronounced with a, an alveolar N, na, nor, I suppose you'd want to call these. And of course, we call them dontya no and murdonya no, but they're both nors. Actually, the sound is the same. We linguists know that. And similarly with the to, to, do, etc. There, um, there are the ones that are called um, dontya to and murdonya to. And yet the sound is the same. Now, we'll talk in a minute about the reason why this is the case, but the fact is that it is. And so Assamese has many more consonants than is actually needed to write the sounds of the language. And you'll see, for example, there are three sounds, there are three chors down here, which are written with X in the IPA, and which go back to three distinct sounds in Sanskrit, but in Assamese they are all pronounced the same. Similarly, the saws, these were two distinct sounds in Sanskrit and are still distinct sounds in a language like Hindi, where they're da and cha, but they have become saw in Assamese. One of the really confusing things for foreigners visiting Assam is that people will write their names using a, an anglicised spelling that assumes that the um, language is still possessing the original pronunciation. So my uh, friend, Professor Sondro Borua. The name is pronounced Sondro, but it's, he still writes C-H-A-N-D-R-A -A because that is the kind of spelling that represents the original pronunciation of these consonants. Now, I don't know at what point in history the consonant phonemes in Assamese merged. Some of you might, but the point is that I don't think there's any doubt but that this document is correct in telling us which symbols are applying to which phonemes and that there are multiple phonemes in us there are multiple phonemes in Assamese that have more than one symbol attached to them. Okay, so why do we have all these redundant letters in Assamese? So if we look at um, a list of consonants um, in, and I'm, I don't know enough Hindi to know if all of these distinctions are still present in Hindi, but certainly when I studied Sanskrit, all of these distinctions were regarded as being present in Sanskrit. And this table, I'm afraid, does not have the 
semi vowels that sorry the the um ra ya la wa or va on it so there are a few letters missing here and ha but if you like the um main set of consonants are here and essentially what's happened in assamese is that the Mordonia and Donkia series have merged, whereas they have not merged in other languages in the rest of India. Okay, so the Assamese alphabet essentially is based on the system for Sanskrit and the Brahmi alphabets that were developed to write it. And they had different consonants. They had different sounds from what Assamese has today. Okay, so in conclusion, why don't writing systems match phoneme systems? So, point number one, languages often change so that even at the time of the adoption of the writing system, so even if when the writing system was adopted, there was a one-to-one -one matching of symbols and sounds, as sound systems change, if the writing doesn't change with them, then a mismatch will occur. Now, in a way, it's a pity that um, everybody hasn't learned both standard Thai and Lao language and writing because these two languages are very similar, but the writing is very, very different. And that's because standard Thai maintains all of the original spellings, even though the sounds of consonants have changed, but Lao has re-spelled everything to, to make it um, much closer to the way words are pronounced. And if you had learned both of those languages, you'd see both sides of what's going on. So a language like German, for example, they regularly change their spelling system to update it. But languages like Burmese and Tibetan are extremely archaic in their writing systems, and their writing systems are now very different from their um, pronunciation. So, because of language change, if the writing doesn't change, then you will, there will be a, a, an ever increasing gap between the way the language sounds and the way it's written. But the second point, and this is probably even more important, is that languages are often written with writing systems borrowed from a different language. In fact, not often, almost always. So, the Latin writing system that we use was borrowed from Latin and it was itself developed over time, as I said before, with co contact with other languages in Italy and also the influences of Greek. So the Latin, even the Latin script for Roman, for the, the Latin Roman script for the Latin language in classical Latin was not actually developed for the language. Examples of scripts that have been developed for languages are quite rare because most of the language, most of the scripts of Southeast Asia have gradually developed over time from um, other scripts. So that, for example, the Thai script was influenced certainly by Khmer, which was itself influenced by Old Mon, which was itself influenced by the Pallava script brought over from South India, which itself goes back to the Brahmi script and so on and so on. So what you'll find is that languages develop writing systems that were, that are based, that are taken from another language, the right, the actual letters were invented for another language and adopted them. And sometimes the new language has fewer consonants or more and fewer vowels or more. So English, for example, has more consonant sounds and more vowel sounds than Latin. But it didn't create new letters to write them. Um, tone languages are very frequently written with scripts that don't mark tones, or that has been true until quite recently and still is in some cases. So now they're starting to write them in some languages. And that's because oftentimes those scripts were borrowed from other scripts, which were borrowed from other scripts, which were borrowed from other scripts. So um, people will talk about things like, um, uh, you know, 
an alphabet that relates or script that relates to a particular language. But since that language, since that script is often borrowed from somewhere else, then um, in, in its application, issues come up. And that's why, in a sense, when the International Phonetic Alphabet was invented, so many new symbols had to be created because the European languages that were using the Roman script or the Latin script, they can be called either, um, all had sounds that ancient Latin did not have. Okay, so that's really what I had intended to say today and is enough, I think, for you to listen to. So first I'm going to stop the recording.